Hey everybody, this is Josh McKinney, and I just want to welcome you to episode 46 of the I Suck at Jujutsu show. Now today is episode three of four in kind of our uh, mini mental health uh, awareness Monday. Wow, that's a lot of M's, uh, but mini mental health awareness, that's too much. Okay, let's just call it mental health awareness Mondays. Let's drop the mini. Okay, so mental health awareness Mondays, three of four. Uh, today, we are going to talk to Mark Vivas. Now, Mark is somebody that I have known probably, I, I think since maybe White Belt, but I think it's Blue Belt. I fought one of his students when I was a Blue Belt, and uh, it had turned out that Mark and my coach had fought I think like four or five different times and I actually fought, you know, he, he lives in Chicago. We, I live in St. Louis. And so there's about five hours between us. So any of the big tournaments, they're usually hosted in Chicago. And I have fought a bunch of his students, a bunch of different matches and uh, won some and lost some. But now at this point, we are part of the same affiliation. Uh, it's funny how that happens in Jiu Jitsu. If there is a small life lesson to take out of the intro, it is that you never know who you're going to be on a team with in jiu-jitsu or you never know who you're going to network with so you should like uh treat people really well in jiu-jitsu and stop commenting such dumb stuff about people that you don't know on instagram but you know you, you never know if you're going to be i mean okay let, let's look at it like this you are uh, a white a blue belt a purple belt or something like that and you are bashing whomever um, you're bashing Gordon Ryan on the gram and um, you hate him because you know whatever whatever reason you hate him I'm sure he gives you a lot of reasons to hate him but you absolutely hate him and you are going to bash him on Instagram uh, and then one day your coach who maybe you guys don't have an affiliation at all he decides that he wants to be affiliated with Henzo Gracie well, guess what? Gordon Ryan is now your teammate, and he probably remembers that you know you were trashing him on Instagram. He may not. A lot of people trash him on Instagram, but for the sake of argument, we will say that he does. And then he beats you up for it. How is that going to make you feel? How are you going to like that? You're not going to like that. You're going to be this person's teammate now, and you hated him for whatever reason. And you see that so often in jujitsu. You see that so often in everything. But this is a jujitsu podcast, so we will make it specific to jujitsu. People want to just bash people on social media. And generally, when called out, they just cower. Uh, and so that's embarrassing. You know what I mean? Don't bash somebody and then back down. If you're going to attack somebody and they respond, they see your comment, they respond, you better stand up for it because you're going to look even stupider. And so I think that's just a, an important side note. But back to Mark, who is now my teammate, who I never bashed. I've always really liked Mark because we're both Asian. But uh, Mark is one of the best master's competitors on the planet. I didn't check before looking at this, but it's very common for him to be top two, three. Uh, I don't think he's ever hit that first spot at – is he master two? I think, no, no, he's master three now. But yes, I don't know if he's ever hit that first spot. I don't know. I, I could, I should message him. I should have messaged him before this. But if he has, I'm sure I will be corrected. But he's been super, super close. I know that for sure. Uh, but Mark's a really good guy. He is a very good black belt. He is a staple of the jujitsu community in Chicago, which is a huge jiu-jitsu community he has had a school down there for a long period of time now the cool thing about mark is that he came on and we started talking before a little bit before um, the episode and mark tried to commit suicide one time in his life and he mentioned that to me and he said hey i i've never talked about this on a public forum he says my students know about it but i'm willing to talk about this if you you know, if you would like, and, um, you know, to see somebody that is at that high level of jujitsu and is using, is using that is, is, is taking, uh, is willing to admit to 
that and is willing to talk about it is it's crazy. It is insane that that he would do that in a good way, right? He 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 like to to be willing to take the heat because people are going to look at anything negative, but especially something that it has so much stigma like attempting suicide. And he was willing to go on this on this public forum and talk about it. And that was um, something that I think should be so commended. And and I really think that this episode could be something that is incredibly helpful to people. So I really challenge you guys, if you, if you are one of these people, but if you know someone that has struggled with depression, especially to the point of suicide, uh, or struggled with with some form of mental health to the form of suicide. It, it, please share this episode with them. Okay, please just share it. Say, hey, the one Asian dude on the episode that talks before the episode starts said that I should probably share this with you. It could be really helpful, uh, and I really think it could be. Uh, just knowing that that somebody that in the jiu-jitsu community is so looked up to has struggled with this and combated this and to see where he's at now i think it can give so much hope to somebody and so that's my challenge for you guys without further ado here is the episode i know you guys are really gonna love it All right, Mark, how are you doing, man? I'm doing good. I'm doing good, Josh. How are you? I am good. I'm good. Is everything good at the school? How are, how are things going right now? You know, uh, and I'm sure as a school owner yourself, I'm sure you could pretty much attest that uh, as far as work goes, we've probably wor- never worked harder uh, than before. We've probably never worked harder at being a school owner than, as we are right now. I'm, I'm sure that's the case. Mm-hmm. Uh, you find yourself doing a lot of things that you're – you, you just haven't, number one, you haven't done in a while. Number two, uh, you probably never thought you'd be having to do. But um, to be honest with you, it's kind of refreshing in a matter of speaking because it's, I'm doing things that I've never done before and I'm learning new skills. And immediately, I basically am wasting all my time on Amazon to kind of make myself better. <laughs> things and stuff like that. So I'm like, oh, stop spending money. And I'm like, uh, I want to buy that because it'll make me better at making videos, mm-hmm. audio, so forth and so on. I need better lighting for instructionals, things like that. Mm-hmm. It's pretty funny. But uh, yeah, I mean, I'm sure you're going through the same thing. How's everything for you? Man, everything's good, but I it, literally dealing with the same thing. You know I mean, just trying to um, provide as much for my students as I can. Actually, um, it's, it's not completely confirmed, but I'll say it because it's my podcast and I'll say whatever I want. But I have... Uh, uh, Jason Neef from Kicksight, who's supposed nice. to come on, um, and just kind of, you know, like I know you follow it, they've given a lot of good ideas on what school owners can do, and I haven't seen many ideas be out there, you know, and so, right. um, or anything very innovative. You were one of the first people I knew that said, you know, like we, we use the same software, which is Kicksight for our schools, and you said, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start, I'm just gonna blow this video library up. I'm going to give you guys so much uh, content, you know, and be something that you can provide for your students. How many, how many, like out of curiosity, how many videos have you shot already for that uh, library? Oh man. I don't know. I've been doing really long ones. And so like, cause we're doing a lot of question and answer ones. Uh, um, a lot of hours. I also did an instructional, like I shot right. my own instructional, right. not the one that's on BJJ fanatics, but right. one that, uh, just for my students. And I was like, it's something I'd planned on doing before. It's called the essentials of jujitsu. And we look at like the five main positions of jujitsu and just dive really deep into all of them. And so that was a really long instructional. And then I released it in 10 parts to my students. Um, and so we've, you know, just done a lot of different stuff. Yeah. For me, I've just literally just, I have this long outline. It's about, it's at least 25 pages long just single space, just everything just branches out into everything. And I'm literally just color coding everything. All right, I've recorded this and this and this. 
I probably have uh, 400 little videos all about four or five minutes each and stuff that are all because I'm breaking down little every little thing and trying to edit and upload everything is just a pain in the butt. Dude, it's, that's the hardest thing. Uh, it's, it is. It really is. I, I can record that technique, that position, one shot, no problem. Got it. And then all of a sudden, like now it takes about 45 minutes just to edit it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that's four upload. minutes. It's four minutes of your life, and then all of a sudden, it, it turns into an hour, an extra hour. Mm -hmm. Like, a, that's just one video, and it just is very annoying. You don't like the sound and all this other stuff. Uh -huh. It's yeah, crazy. It's nuts. It, it, Podcasting is the same way. I mean, I can sit down with you for an hour, and it is so simple. You know, I send you the meeting invitation. We record. We talk about whatever we want, and then all of a sudden, we get to this point where we're like, okay, we're done with it. Now I have to, uh, uploading the audio is super easy, but I'm trying to move to uploading stuff onto YouTube too. And uh, it lit it's such a pain. It literally adds like three hours of work per episode because I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> ah, but you'll get there, you'll get there. It's, yeah. it's funny too because uh, a couple of people asked me, hey, Mark, why don't you start a podcast? I'm not starting a podcast, Josh, because you already took the name that I would have chosen. <laughs> So uh, now I got to adjust it and basically be like, you suck at jujitsu, <laughs> which is <laughs> very condescending or all of us suck at jujitsu now. <laughs> what, like, yeah, what if you went uh, with what my second name was going to be of the podcast? You could go with handsome Asian jujitsu. <laughs> well, not anymore. Let's settle that argument once and for all. You are the king, handsome Asian stuff. I mean, you, look, are, you are. I'm not trying to be that guy, but when we did our, um, our big tag team team meeting over zoom, yo, know, hey, Jared did mention that I was a good-looking guy like two different times. He know, did. So. He did. He did. All I know at uh, – did you make it to Tech Team, uh, to tech team Day uh, last year? In August? I, I didn't, no. You didn't? Uh -uh. All right. We did have a little bit of a battle, uh, Asian black belt battle during the Friday night. Uh, we called it the Panda Express Cup. <laughs> <laughs> it was just me versus Harold Lee. I'm like, all right, let's just get this over with. And I just go like, apparently we're fighting for the Pan Express Cup, uh, so let's go. So and it, was, it, was, it was fun. It was all, you know, all choking and everything like that. But there's only two Asians that day. We need more. Okay. So all oh, over. Yeah. We're going to add 50% of that. <laughs> I keep my school completely Asian-free besides myself. You know? Uh, when I first started, uh, well, actually it was my younger brother that started New Breed uh, here in Chicago. When we first started – we were on the Northwestern campus and it was just a bunch of Asian guys and Northwestern students. <laughs> so we nicknamed ourselves team math and science because <laughs> our competition team, basically it was just a small ragtag group of like eight to 10 guys. That's, it was just, it was like garage training. Uh -huh. And uh, we would go to these Nagas with just eight to 10 guys. And it would just be uh, my younger brother, who he's probably soaking what 145 pounds, but he's jacked, just jacked, <laughs> prison jacked guy. And, uh, and then there was me, I was the big guy and a whole bunch of nerds just from Northwestern Asian nerds, glasses and stuff like that. Um, I don't know if Kyle has ever mentioned Quan Huang. He was actually one of the co-founders of, uh, of our school here. He's probably what, 5'11", might've been 125, 130 pounds at the time, hunched back and everything, two-time national best-selling author in China. And he was like one of the co-founders and he was just like, you're just, and eight to 10 Asian guys just go into a Naga and just wreck everybody. That's and, awesome. It was, it was pretty funny. That was back in 04, 05, a little bit of 06 and like the very beginning of 07. But uh, yeah, there was a good two three year period a three year period where there's just a whole bunch of nerds just walking into a jiu-jitsu tournament with really horrible target board shorts and uh, <laughs> just mismatched <laughs> mismatched top and bottom geese uh that would just you know we would just fight and have a good That's, time that is awesome so you, recently i had the pleasure of going to your school to celebrate was it your 15 year anniversary 15 year anniversary yes the 15 year anniversary we opened up november 2004 okay and this is something i i don't know if a lot of other schools do anything like this this was something that was pretty unique that i've ever experienced was this 15 year celebration that was just huge man it was really cool <laughs> 
Thanks. Uh, thanks for that. For me, it's um, it, it, these guys have become my family. And it's, it's um, I, I have a, let's get this. So back in 94, I sat there and was living honestly about a mile away from where my gym is at currently. And um, things happened in 94 where I had to move to the Philippines and I went to college there in the Philippines from 94 to April of 99, April, April 1st, actually. I moved back April 1st of 1999 back to Chicago. How old were um, you in 94? 94, 18. I was, just, zero. I was zero just in case you were wondering. But. <laughs> you, were, you were a thought. Yes, yes. Yeah, you were a potential thought. I was born in 94, so it just depends <laughs> on where you were, wh what, what point. You know. <laughs> I know, right, right. Uh, but um, yeah, so I went over there and uh, to the Philippines and stuff. Went to college and all that other fun stuff. Just you know, was busy getting prison jacked and working out. Didn't train jujitsu or anything like that. And um, in '99, I kind of got kicked out of my. I kind of got kicked out of the country. <laughs> uh, my, my parents basically, uh, you know, I was just I was just a young kid. Uh, I didn't know what the heck I was doing. And uh, my parents bought me a one way ticket back to Chicago gave me $250 and said, don't come back here. Um, yeah, like, do not come back here. Like, you know, until you basically make something of yourself. Like, you know, I didn't understand the value of money. I didn't like do anything. I was just pretty reckless kid. I mean, aren't we all? So I landed in April of 1999 with my 250 bucks. My older brother was uh, still living here for a little bit. He ended up moving to California shortly thereafter. But then uh, he was just like, here's the car. I paid, for the, I paid the first two months a car note on it so you can use it. I paid the insurance. But after that, you're basically on your own. You're going to live with our uncle, so forth and so on. I was like, cool, awesome. Had my 250 bucks. Uh, first thing I did, bought a PlayStation Final Fantasy set. Wasted money right off the bat. That's like, that like 120 bucks right, gone right there. Uh -huh. Half my money gone. And thankfully, thankfully, it was much easier to get a job back then. So mm -hmm. I had three jobs before you knew it, before the weekend was over, I had three jobs. So, you know, it's, you know, I started building myself up, building myself up. But ever since that, and then I moved to, um, I moved to the East Coast in Delaware in July of 99. So I was kind of bouncing back and forth. My, what, what reason did you move? So uh, my ex-wife had family over there. And um, unbeknownst to me, my ex-wife was pregnant with my 20-year-old daughter at the time. Uh, back, you know, I had already moved here to the States and uh, didn't know that she was pregnant. So we decided that she was going to try to migrate here to the United States. So we just said it was just, just going to be a lot easier for her um, you know, to, make the, to, make the, to, to make the adjustment from living in the Philippines to living in the United States if we lived on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. So we moved the whole kind of business operation over there. Uh, and I ended up moving to uh, Delaware in 99. And then after that, it was, you know, I quit jujitsu. I was already doing jujitsu. I started jujitsu end of tail end of 97, beginning of 98. And I was doing jujitsu already. And just like, you know, I was actually helping my younger brother, my younger and my older brother teach Brazilian jujitsu at their academy in the Philippines. They had been doing jujitsu in 95. Unless they had started jujitsu in 95, if I'm not mistaken. They actually, at the time, were living in Chicago, and I was going to school in the Philippines. And uh, my younger brother was going to college here. And uh, they met with, uh, they were they're really big into Muay Thai and Jeet Kune Do. And of course, Jeet Kune Do is ever evolving. And it turned towards a grappling kind of focus at that time, at the place that they were training. And ended up happening is that they decided, hey, we like jujitsu. We're going to start training jujitsu. So they trained at Carlson Gracie Juniors uh, downtown. They both received their blue belts there. And then they moved back to the Philippines and, you know, work takes you wherever. Uh, I'm sorry, work and school take you wherever. So they moved back to the Philippines and started uh, Carlson Gracie Junior Team Philippines with the blessing of Junior. Uh, back in 96, I want to say, I know that then depending on who you ask in the Philippines, uh, you know, Everyone's going to say like, oh, this person started jujitsu in the Philippines. This person started jujitsu in the Philippines. And, you know, I don't even really care because I wasn't doing jujitsu at the time. I was just busy trying to look good for the ladies. And just of course, yeah. Which of is course. what we do That's now. A, yeah. Well, well, yeah, of course. That's, 
that's why I lift. No, no. <laughs> but um, yeah, that's I wasn't I wasn't even training at the time, and ends up happening is that uh, you know they started a school. I think they were actually the first school to open to open. I don't know if they if my brothers brought jujitsu there, but I th- I want to say they might have been the first school to actually open and offer jujitsu, first martial arts school to do that. So we did that, and it was funny because back in the day. Uh, you know how there's always BJJ drama and stuff? Of course. Oh, no, no, no. I've never even heard of jujitsu yeah. drama. What are you talking about? I don't know. What social media? What are you talking about, man? Like, let me, hold on. Let me check my Instagram and Facebook. Yeah. But um, back then, the jujitsu drama, it was like, uh, in the Philippines, it was like a gang war. Like, people would, like, pull guns on each other and all this <laughs> other stuff and beatings and i could tell you some crazy stories about that some that involve my friends and everything like that and it's just like guys would just pull guns on each other and knives and all this other stuff it was nuts it was nuts so in a blessing in disguise it was kind of good for me to get out of the philippines and stuff but yeah so we started you know my family had that jujitsu school um and it was fun, man. It was really, really cool to kind of see something grow. And I saw something grow little by little. And then when I moved to the East Coast in July of 99 and stuff, that I started being away from my family. I mean, my parents were in the Philippines. Uh, my younger brother at the time was in, uh, still in the Philippines. Everyone was still in the Philippines except for my older brother who was living in San Diego. Uh-huh. So ever since 99, I was pretty much always living apart. And... Um, you know, things happen and stuff like that. And I'm not the greatest communicator all the time. Uh, you know, I, for me, I'm so consumed with what I do uh, with the people that are literally right in front of me. that sometimes I forget to call like my brothers or my parents and stuff like that. And back mm-hmm. then, of course, there was no, there was no Zoom. There was yeah. no Facebook. There was no Instagram or anything like that. And it's funny now because if I want to talk to my parents, I'll just post something on Instagram and then they'll comment on it. And then they'll comment on it and we just talk like that real fast, little quick blurbs and stuff. Uh, but back then trying to communicate with people wasn't the same. So when I moved back from Delaware to, to, to 03 and, uh, and uh, yeah, I'm sorry, to Delaware, uh, from Delaware to Chicago in 03, uh, it was Labor Day of 03. Um, you know, I was still basically alone by myself. And then I was at the time, I had already picked up jujitsu. We'll get to you in a second. And, um, for me, you know, I was just always trying to find a place. And then in November of 04, for like a year, November of 04, my younger brother actually moved in with me for a little bit. And he was wanted to train jiu-jitsu. Uh, he was training with us again at Carlson's. And Quan, that, that person I mentioned earlier and stuff, uh, Quan, my younger brother, and myself were basically the smallest guys at Carlson Gracie Jr.'s at that time. And uh, at that time, Carlson Gracie Junior School, there was a lot of big guys, like a lot of big guys, tons mm-hmm. of big guys, uh, just jack dudes. And my younger brother just goes, you know, I, I can't train here. Everyone's just way too damn big. Like, and he was training for an MMA fight. Mm-hmm. Uh, fun story about that. We we're at Junior's and it was just like uh, a Junior's old school was located inside uh, like a 24-hour fitness, like a fitplex, like an yeah. LA fitness and stuff. So we were in the boxing ring and he was getting ready for his MMA fight. And he, my younger brother beat the crap out of Quan and I just beat us senseless, senseless. And then he just looks at us and he looks at us and he just, you know, shaking his head, looks at us with a straight face and goes, I need better training partners. And, walks <laughs> us. and we're like, we're like, damn, <laughs> that's, that's, all right, right on. And then yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, like I'm sorry. I did. I gave you everything I could, and you whooped me like a. I mean, you whooped me silly. He was a brown belt at the time, and I was just a like, blue belt and everything like that. And Quan was just a white belt. He just beat the ever living heck out of us. So he, uh, like, we did a little looking around, and uh, he decided he wanted to open up his own shop, and we opened up New Breed in November of '04. Uh, shortly thereafter, my younger brother took a job in February of 05 uh, to move back to the Philippines. It was a pretty high profile job and he took it. He, I would have taken it too if it was offered to me. So he moved back to the Philippines and gave me the keys to the gym. He gave me the keys to the academy and said, hey, do whatever you want to do with it. And for me, I, was just, I literally was just a fresh purple belt at the time. Mm-hmm. Just a fresh purple belt. I just gotten, uh, you know, like I just, like, uh, just literally just got a no like a week before we opened up new breed, uh, 
uh, Newbury in Chicago. Newbury, uh, it was Newbury Academy at the time. Now it's Newbury Training Center. But um, I didn't know what the heck to do at all. So I called up Carlson Gracie Jr. because he's a family friend. I actually knew Jr. before I started really training jiu-jitsu. And I called him up and I told him, well, my, my brother left me the academy. And uh, if you want to, because I've got loyalty to you, Jr., you're my friend. Uh, if you want to, I'll shut this thing down. And then Jr. was like, no, no, no. Your brother left it to you. Go run it. Take care of those guys. And I'm like, okay. So what's funny is that I called him two days later. <laughs> it was a Tuesday when I first called him. I called him on Thursday, asked him again, just to make sure. Literally just asked him again. I'm like, Junior, you, you understand the type of person that I am. I'm like, you know, I just, I'm a very kind of like self, self-driving, self-focused, like, you mm-hmm. know, just kind of not so uh, individual when it comes to trying to get stuff done. Uh, and he yelled at me. He's just like, I already told you, <laughs> go do what your brother told you to do. Go take care of these guys. And then he hung up on me. And, <laughs> and I was like, all right, well, you're not getting a third call. So, yeah. um, you know, I waited a week. I hadn't broken the news to anyone other than Quan that, um, that my younger brother wasn't coming back. Uh, so after I waited a week, and then we trained hard and everything, and then I brought all the guys together. And I basically gave them, I guess, a little bit of a speech, a little bit of like a uh, yeah, a little bit of a speech at that time. It was just a couple of us. And I said, like, look, I know I'm just a new purple belt. And I know that there are, you know, other, you guys have other alternatives. But we started something here. And I like what we started. Like, you know, and if you guys give me everything that you have, I'll give you everything that I have. And uh, let's just take this as far as we can go. And, you know, it was, I remember at that moment, something, I could see everyone's face. I could see everyone's face. And something clicked in all of them which basically is just became like, all right, we're just, we're just going to slam on the gas and not let up. And uh, fast, uh, these guys became my family. Like this was something that I was always looking forward to doing at the time. Excuse me. At the time we were only training maybe three times a week, something like that. But those three times I was working like a 50 hour a week job at the time. But those three times that we met up those three, two hours, I was constantly looking for, and again, I was living by myself at that time in Chicago. I mean, it was just me. I was away from my family. I was away from my brothers. I was away from, uh, you know, my, my parents and everything. Um, I was away from my daughter at that time. Um, you know, I was, I was just by myself. So these guys became my family. Mm-hmm. And over the years, that family just grew and grew and grew and grew and grew and grew. And, grew. and uh, you know, for me, like that 15 year anniversary, no, it was just a culmination of all of that. It was just, it was extremely hard to kind of talk. It was extremely hard to kind of like not smile. But uh, I think one of the first things uh, I said during that 15 year anniversary is that I just sat there. I'm like, guys, thanks for coming. And then I just stopped. I looked at everyone and I was like, this, I, don't, I was like, just, just looks really cool. Just yeah. Ton of, it was just really, really cool. I've just never seen that many people on the map. Uh, clearly violating some fire code. Well, actually, that's well. Never that many people on the mat at our gym at, at that uh-huh. gym. Uh, tag team train, tag team day last year was that's that was ridiculous. Mm-hmm. But um, in our gym, we've never had that type of audience, and it was it was great. It was insane. Um, the, the you know it just you could without people didn't need to talk to each other in order to actually kind of see and realize that they were they were there for something special. So, I mean, there was that. And then of course you guys went, got in Korean barbecue. I went and ate a <laughs> hot dog and a beef, an Italian beef. And then, and then we all met up later on that night. So for me, every five years, I try to uh, make a, like, you know, throw a big party. I don't want my students spending on anything and everything like that. And just like everyone just kick back, relax, have a good time and stuff. You know, like if you're, if you're an adult and you're legal, have a couple drinks, <laughs> drink responsibly, drive responsibly, Uber, Uber's a great thing. Uh, but, you know, it just, just, you know, the number of people that I was able to talk to that, that evening at the party that just basically like tell me how jujitsu has changed their lives, how the gym has changed their lives. Um, for me, that's, that's like the best part of the whole thing. That's, it's, I've always sat there and told myself, like, 
So to clear the air, I'm Chinese. Okay, so I'm Chinese. No, I did not bring Corona here. Oh, I've heard <laughs> rumors that said that you did. Uh, no, that was. Uh, uh, I will like as an aside. This the remember how we were? Was it like uh, at the end of February? We we're at Kyle's uh, for well, Jared's summer at Jared's yes. seminar, and they were, they were talking about like how I guess the first American death was on someone on the West Coast. Uh-huh. And then, I was like, was it Jared? Jared looks at both you and me. He's like, what have you guys done? <laughs> what have you guys done? And I'm like, what, what, what? What happened? What happened? Yeah. And, you know, uh, uh, someone said, like, oh, they have the first reported American death in Washington State. And everyone's looking around, and I'm just like, excellent. My plan is working. <laughs> just, like you, yeah. just like you planned it. Exactly. Just like we planned it. The world domination starts. <laughs> nah, but it's, you know, all jokes aside, I mean, that's a very touchy subject and stuff like that. But uh, I got my last picture of thought. But like, um, yeah, it's for me, you know, everyone became a family. Um, and well, getting back to the Chinese thing, uh, my parents, you know, tiger mom, tiger dad, uh-huh. you know, TV's thrown at me. Got the, I got my butt be so many times until I basically grew up and started shaving my, my, uh, I grew up and could take the pain. So then my parents started pulling my sideburns. So then I started, <laughs> that hurts by the way. That hurts like hell. You could pull up here and that doesn't hurt. You pull at the sideburns and man, that's pain. That is pain. That is a lot of pain. So then we started shaving, uh, you know, the sides, <laughs> shaving our sideburns off. And then it was at that point, I remember it vividly. I was, I was like 14, 15 years old. We all get sat down by my mom and said, like, you know, you guys are going, you're getting older now. And, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to discipline you guys like that anymore. And the whole time I'm thinking to myself, it's because we, we're immune to the belt. <laughs> like that doesn't hurt anymore. You got to hit us with like a car or something. <laughs> and we started shaving our sideburns off. You have nothing to pull. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, this is great. <laughs> like, so the whole time, like, you know, I was just being a little punk kid and stuff. But like, uh, it's it, it, like again, like getting back to um, the whole family aspect, like everything like that. For me, I just wanted to be able to make a change, um, make a change in someone's life, or at least help use jujitsu or use the academy, use teaching jujitsu as a way to kind of help somebody. Uh, in the way that jujitsu helped me, yeah. um, you know, it's, it's like, again, my parents, Asian parents and stuff, they're, they, they want, I'm supposed to be a doctor. <laughs> I was <laughs> like, honestly, uh, a pre-med biology, uh, I, tr- I graduated pre-med biology with a minor in chemistry. Uh, I helped start the family business. One of the family businesses in the Philippines by making detergent in our garage with a shovel and a bunch of chemicals. We, we <laughs> literally made five. We literally made Tide, just powdered Tide and stuff. So for them, you know, they, they, they saw being successful as monetary. Mm-hmm. For me, you know, of course it was like that before. Of course, you, know, you don't know any better. But then for me, it just it turned out to be, I just wanted to make, I wanted to help one person. And that night, it was, it was cool because, uh, you know, the amount of people that, that would come up to me and just say, you know, um, I would never have thought that I would love jujitsu this much and love everyone in this room so much. Uh, the amount of things, the amount of lessons that jujitsu and being on this team have taught me um, are, are beyond words. Mm-hmm. They've, they've taught people social skills. They've taught people discipline, um, so forth and so on, all that stuff. And, um, you know, I had to go through that whole process too. So going back to, uh, going back to like 02, 03, uh, I was doing jujitsu before and I stopped pretty much cold Turkey in 1999. And uh, of course I was, uh, you know, I, I just moved, I just moved to Delaware. I was taking for care of my first kid. Uh, you know, and I was married at the time. Things happened where, uh, you know, uh, things happened where due to immigration stuff and everything like that, it was just like, we had to kind of go back and forth to the Philippines or my ex-wife had to go back and forth to the Philippines mm-hmm. and it took a toll. And unfortunately things happened and stuff. And, um, I actually, I remember it was June of Oh two. Uh, no, things were just rough. I was, it was a rough time in my life. And, um, you know, it's, it was just, I, I honestly don't remember the exact details. All I remember 
is, uh, you know, my whole family was there and we were just talking and stuff. And then I remember going to bed. I remember going to bed. It was like a late, it was late night. It was maybe like two thirty, three o'clock, uh, on a, on a Sunday night. Uh, I could look up the exact it is on a Sunday night in June of O2. And I remember going to bed. I was laying next to my daughter who was uh, two and a half at the time. And I remember literally, I don't know what happened, but I remember walking out to the balcony, just walking out the sliding door of a three story balcony and literally jumping off the balcony head first. Um, I landed head first. So like right into basically uh, we were living in like a condo thing uh, right into like the communal backyard. And, um, I don't know why I did it. Like, well, clearly things were going bad in my life and stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know exactly what triggered it. I just remember laying down and the next thing you know, I'm literally about maybe about five yards away from the balcony and jumping over the top. And uh, when it head first, I got up, (laughs) I I, I got up and I walked all the way up the stairs back to my condo, uh, back to my apartment, uh, opened up the door. Everyone's freaking out in there. And, um, you know, and I remember just laying down. Well, I made it back to my bedroom, laid down, and passed out. Um, thankfully, the then passed out, and then the paramedics came. And I remember talking to the paramedics, and the paramedic walks into the bedroom, says like, "Hey there, buddy, um, what happened?" And I'm like, "Jumped off the balcony." I just remember saying, "Jumped off the balcony." And then I remember getting, uh, I remember a little bit of the ambulance ride, and then I remember being in the ER. Uh, I don't know if I was drugged up already. And, um, but like, it's just like, you know, I hit rock bottom. I yeah. literally hit rock bottom there. And, uh, you know, I, thankfully I only came out with a broken collarbone. Uh, but it was for, you know, obviously, you know, had to go through a whole bunch of therapy and everything like that. Uh, didn't take as long as I thought, to be honest with you. Yeah. But, um, uh, but, you know, I was kind of, again, living by myself, uh, in late July, August. And I was a broken, I was a broken guy. I literally turned myself into a robot and, uh, you know, had not, had, had nothing. So I was just going to work and everything else, just trying to do what I can for my daughter. They had moved back to the Philippines. So, you know, I was just there by myself. And for almost a whole year, I was just like, well, going into 03, I, you know, I just, it basically, I think it was like April, March of 03, like that, that I decided I needed to pick myself back up uh, and just stop. But I didn't really know what I was doing. So I started, of course, working out again and doing all this. Um, and then I talked to my brother one day. It was in May of 03. I talked to my brother one day and I just said, you know what? I want to go back to doing what I was that I, what, you know, that I loved the most when I was single. And, I was, and that was jujitsu. You know, I gave mm-hmm. up jujitsu to raise my first kid. So, and I, I asked my older brother, I'm like, all right, where's a good jujitsu place in Delaware? And of course, that was when internet was just like dial up internet. Hey, mm-hmm. well, we needed the right disc, all that other fun stuff, right? So, yeah, there were slim pickings in Delaware. There was Taikai Jiu Jitsu at the time. So, my older brother asks me, he's just like, hey, how close are you to Philly? Like, how close are you to Philly? So, and I'm like, eh, it's not super far and everything like that. And he's just like, all right, look this address up. So I map quested it because there was no Google Maps. Uh-huh. Or anything like that. An hour away. And I'm like, well, if you're telling me that that's the best place, I will go there and train there. It's a 51-minute drive. Uh, and, I, and he's saying like, yeah, that guy's good. That guy's good. That guy just happened to be Jared Weiner. Mm-hmm. So I met Jared in uh, May of 03. Uh, that's a whole nother funny story too, because my older brother and my uh, and, and Jared, they were in the same division. They were both brown belts at the time, and they were same division. They're both competitors. So it's funny when I called up Jared. He's like BJJ United, and I'm like, Hey, how you doing? Uh, I'm interested in taking up jujitsu. Um, and he's just like, Cool, cool. What's your name? I'm like, My name is Mark Vivez. He's like, Mark Vivez, and in relation to Mike Vivez. And I was like, Yeah, that's my older brother. He's like, he's like, no joke. I'm literally watching video of your brother right now. <laughs> That's awesome. Right now. He was literally scouting my brother when I talked to, when I was talking to him. So it was hilarious. So I remember going there the next day, waking up like at 530, start driving an, an hour north to Philly. And I walk in 
around 7.15 for a 7.30 a.m. class. I didn't start work till later on the day. I walk in and I see Jared there with his cup of coffee watching his little kind of like 12-inch TV screen, 14 12-inch TV screen, and it's uh, off, of the v off a VHS tape. And he's watching, no joke, a match of my brother fighting. And I think it was from that, the recent pants. And he's literally just watching it. And I walk in, he does a double take. He's like, holy shit. Sorry, sorry for cussing, but he's like, you can say oh. whatever you want on the show. There you go. He's like, he's like, oh shit. Like you've got to be his brother. You've got to be his brother. <laughs> we look exactly alike. We look exactly alike. So it's just like, like he's just doing double takes. He's like, oh my God. And it was funny because for the first like week, for the first week, I thought he was thinking that my brother sent me up there to go scout him. Uh -huh. And I was just like, oh, man, I'm going to get killed in here. <laughs> like, uh -huh. I'm, I'm a dead man. I'm like, this is – like, I'm a plant. I'm clearly a plant. Like, and I'm, you know, I'm like, oh, this is not good. But, yeah, it turned out all good and stuff. But, uh, yeah, and then, you know, I – again, from all that stuff that happened, I was – you know, I found jujitsu again. And it was able to kind of give me a routine, kind of help me build the tools to build myself back up. Um, you know, there's, there's so many things and everyone's has, has said this before. There's so many things, uh, that ju about jujitsu and about the lessons we learn in jujitsu that translate into, uh, into life. Uh, there's so many metaphors that you can think of in jujitsu that translate over to life or vice versa, whatever it's supposed mm -hmm. to be. And for me, I was able to kind of learn to build myself back up from the ground up, learn to kind of essentially problem solve on the fly. Uh, I was a pretty shy person back then. I was a horribly shy person back then. I talked nowhere near as much as I did. And through just being in jiu-jitsu again, um, it just kind of gave me that confidence. And even, even then, as a, as a, how old was I? I have no idea how old I was, mid-20s. I was in my mid-20s. And um, just through being around that environment, you know, it learned me to be confident again. It learned me to... Uh, it, it taught me rather to, uh, you know, just be able to problem solve on the fly to look at everything as just like, you know, every setback that happens is not that big a deal. You just have to identify the problem and be positive about it and work at it. That, that kind of blue collar attitude where you're just going to sit there and put your hard hat on and just go, uh, as Jared always says, like, you know, that East coast Philly vibe and stuff that or that East coast mentality. Um, it's, 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 there's a lot of parallels between Jared and I and the way that we look at things. Mm -hmm. And for me, finding Jared at that moment in time in my life was probably the best thing for me because uh, there's just something about the way that he talks, something about the way that he leads, something about the way that he teaches classes and relates to people that was able to kind of help me almost immediately get over all the BS that was going on in my life and just really be learn to pick myself back up, learn to, just start kind of prioritizing goals again and learn to just, you know, look over, look past all the BS and just kind of get over it. So, I mean, to those people who, who are thinking about jujitsu or have trouble in life or do anything like that, or just are going through any adversity, they just, man, find something like, find your jujitsu, whatever it is. It could be, it could be podcasting. It could be whatever, something that drives you, that fo that allows you to focus and, Something where you can learn where you something that you can see that where there's problem solving involved, uh, where that you can immerse yourself in that allows you to, you know, just really put your heart and soul into it and just allows you to get something out of it. For me, that was jujitsu and it helped, it helped, it saved my life. It literally sat there and everyone says that, everyone says that, but it literally did because if I didn't make that choice to go back to jujitsu and I didn't find a mentor like Jared at that time. Um, I don't know exactly where I would have been. I might still be working behind the desk and so forth and so on. But for me, it was, it, it taught me kind of to really kind of evaluate what's the most important things for me and really kind of just set me on that path to picking myself back up. So now, you know, I, I do the things that I do now to kind of show my students and show my kids um, show my family that like, look, it doesn't matter how bad things get. Like I've been in the gutter, mm -hmm. uh, you know, my, 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 like, you know, and I've, I've been in the gutter. I, you've just, I've been through adversity and you could battle back from it just piece by piece. It, uh, it's, you, it all starts with a choice. 
and that choice, you have to go into that. You have to make that choice knowing that it's going to suck. But after that, as soon as you sit there and start putting the pieces together, everything just works out good. And the next thing you know, you, you'll be, you'll be onto something. So, I mean, that's kind of my story in a nutshell about how kind of, you know, I, uh, why jujitsu is important to me, why I believe it can be important to everyone else and why, you know, it's it, for me, it, it, it really warms my heart, so to speak. Uh, when people come up to me and saying like, you know, thank you for everything that you've done. I've never thought that I could feel, uh, feel the way I do about something like jujitsu. Mm-hmm. So for me, that's super important. That to me, when people say that to me, made it. And I'm just yeah. trying to sit there and, you know, pass that along to as many people as I can while I still can, to be honest with you. Man, that's good. I loved, um, honestly, I was nice just getting to hear your story, um, kind of from the beginning, from the roots of things. I think um, just a few things I'd like to just kind of ask you about, dig into sure. um, before we kind of get to the end of the podcast. Um, and there are a few places we could go, but I just wanted to start with you um, with like the suicide attempt. I wanted to just ask, like, what do you, if you remember at all, even, um, do you remember what your mindset was just in the weeks, months leading up to that? You know, uh, without going into too many, you know, personal details, because it does involve other people. Of course. Like it, it just, it was like a downward, I was on a down, downward, downward. I was going spiraling downward. There you go. I get it. I get uh, it. I get it. Well, I hope everyone else does. Like English is my second language. <laughs> well, normal English is my second language. Slang is my first. But I remember I was just, and my my students when they listen to this podcast, they're gonna laugh when I say this. I was a very angry person, and yeah. my students are all laughing right now because uh-huh. they're still gonna look at me and be like, "You are still an angry person." <laughs> No, I am a f- hyper focused person. No, no. But I was fierce, a very fierce, you know, yeah, <laughs> stubborn. Um, but I was a very angry person back then. I had a horrible, horrible temper, horrible temper. And I remember the slightest thing would set me off. And it just basically, you know, attributed to a lot of negativity in my life. And um, I, I was a super ultra paranoid person and stuff, just like would do things that you know we all have our skeletons and stuff like that and mm-hmm. i would just do things i was just a mean person and you know I, you know leading up to it it was just a culmination of things and you know you find out some you, you know, like it, every every marriage is obviously like you know there's there's many aspects to it right mm-hmm. and it was just failing and the thing is that to me one of the most uh, and still is clearly uh one of the most important things was family and I was just trying to keep our family together and it was difficult because my ex-wife was living in the Philippines primarily and uh you know I couldn't see my daughter all the time and it, it just it sucked and it, I remember uh, it was uh, it was my ex-wife came back from the Philippines on my birthday happy birthday to me uh May 24 of 02 I have this thing with dates I can remember dates <laughs> but um I remember that. And I remember, you know, I was trying to make things happy. I'm trying to make things right. And it just wasn't going the way it was planned. And of course I was like blowing up my top again and stuff. And just things just happened and uh, things were said. And um, I think, I think, and I honestly don't remember all the therapy sessions that I had. I and it was funny because I don't know what it's like now, but back then it was pretty short. Um, I think what it was is what drove me, if I had to analyze the whole thing, what drove me to attempting to take my own life was, was the realization that uh, I wasn't going to be able to fix things. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that. And for me, um, you know, my family unit, my, my, my ex-wife and my, my, my daughter, uh, super important to me. They, they were in my life. And... You know, they, they were they were, my, they were my life at the time, and you know it, and it just seemed like it was gone. So it's yeah. just like, and 
and I don't know, to be honest with you, it's, it, it saddened me so deeply that I just decided, uh, remember, uh, my ex-wife and I were talking, we were talking out in the living room, out in the balcony, actually. And then I remember, it's just like, I think I realized when stuff was just done, I was like, you know what, I'm going to call a night. And I went and uh, just want to lay down next to my daughter. And then I know I fell asleep. At least I'm pretty sure I fell asleep. But after that, I don't remember much. I just remember the night, the first, the, uh, I remember, I don't know. I can't even recall exactly what went through my head. It was like a yeah. blackout, right? And I just remember the next thing I remember after laying down next to my daughter and like, you know, just putting my hand around her. I remember being about five, five yards away, just like walking out, walking out of a sliding door. The balcony is literally right in front of me. I don't know, I don't know how, far, how wide that was. And me just like running. Yeah. And I literally jumped right over that, right over that balcony, like head first. And uh, I think what kind of saved my life, to be honest with you, uh, was basically landing in a field, like kind of like in the field. It was kind of slipped down because like kind of hit it and like uh-huh. went and forward. Rolled, and yeah. yeah and rolled forward. And then, I would have just, and then after that, I remember laying down there for a second. And then I remember walking up back to, back to my apartment or kind of whatever it was and stuff. And just, I don't, re- I don't even remember what I remember walking in the door. I don't even, and then the next thing I know, I remember being on the ground in my bedroom <laughs> and, then the, and then the paramedic right there. But I, mm-hmm. like, and it was, it was really, it was a really weird time. And then again, I remember being a little bit of the ride to the hospital. I remember uh, being in the ER. I'm not the ER. Well, yeah, I guess it's just, then, um, they, you know, I spent, spent a week, you know, obviously in like a psychiatric like unit, mm-hmm. uh, got discharged and, you know, still couldn't, they wouldn't let me back to work just yet. So they, I was going, doing like outpatient stuff there for a week. And then they cleared me and they said like, you're fine. Like you're fine. And I was like, okay, but you still need to sit there and see a, uh, see a therapist once a, once a week. I was like, sure, whatever. I'll do whatever I need to do. I need to, uh, I need to, like, you know, I was a broken person at that time, physically and emotionally, mentally, everything like that. And I was just like, I'll do whatever I need to do. So I went to go see this. And I forget this. I forget this therapist's name, but she was, she was awesome. I mean, guys, go. If, if you think something's wrong with you, if you just need someone to talk to, go find a counselor, go find a therapist. It's a good thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember talking to this person and, the first time, the, I remember actually, the first two weeks I met with her three times a week. Just wanted to make sure. Then after that, she told me, uh, she told me at the end of that sixth session, she said, you know what, I'm supposed to win you down to two times a week, but I've talked to you for quite some time now, and I want you to just come once a week. And so I was like, okay. So I don't know what the heck that meant. Mm-hmm. Two weeks later, she told me, she's just like, you're going to get to a point where coming here is not going to even be necessary anymore. And I'm not going to tell you exactly when that is, but you'll know when that is. And it was funny because uh, I started like not, I started like uh, not like not scheduling or having to reschedule my appointments all the time and stuff. And she was fine with it. And she was, she was the only ther- She's the only employee in her office, just her. So she'd be like, fine, no, no problem and stuff. And it was after about, you know, and I would still have some appointments every so often and stuff and all throughout the summer. And it was, I remember towards the end of the summer, she just calls me. And I, I call, actually, I called her to reschedule. And she said like, Mark, no, this is what I meant. This is what I meant. You don't need to come here anymore because you're handling things. Like you're handling things by yourself. You're coping with it. It's just like, there's no need to reschedule. If you ever need help, this is my number. Just call me. We'll talk over the phone. You don't even need to come in and stuff. We'll just talk over the phone. I never talked to her ever again, never talked to her ever again. And I was just able to, I was very fortunate. I had a very small group of friends that we hung out, played a whole bunch of Madden football and ate pizzas like all the time and stuff. But um, yeah, but it was just, you know, I, I was able to kind of find some sort of norm on mm-hmm. my own, but there was still a lot missing. You know, there was still a lot missing, but the, I, but to answer your question about the mindset, that's, that's kind of like how my mind, that's, that's what I remember to be able yeah. to you, kind of what I learned out of it. That, that makes, so then something you said, and you said this a few times during your story was that you 
had to build yourself back up again. It wasn't a, I think it's, I think it's important to note. It wasn't a switch that you just like, well, I walked into the jujitsu gym and the switch was flipped. It was like, this was what helped me build myself back up. Yes. For me, jujitsu was kind of like the main thing for like, I was searching, I would say it's all throughout the fall and you know, the big, the first quarter of, uh, Oh, well, what was that? Oh, two, you know, uh, Oh three, rather. I was really kind of searching. I was just like a robot. Like I was explaining earlier, I was waking up, you know, trying to get a lift in, go through work. I was working 10 hour days for like four times or whatever the heck it was. And, you know, just kind of work at the second job, uh, work at the second job at GameStop. I love working at GameStop. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> uh, and, you know, it's, it, it, I was just like a robot. I had really no life outside of it. And I didn't like, I, you know, I slowly kind of, it slowly got old. And I was just like, I need to kind of get back. I feel like I'm not going anywhere. And um, it all started with a choice to get back into jujitsu. And, you know, because again, I felt like I was just a robot. I felt like it was just like, like be, not being productive, not, not giving, not building any value in myself. And when I made that choice to do jujitsu, I didn't think, I thought for me, it was just like, I just need to get in better shape. Uh, you know, I liked doing it when I was in single, uh, when I was single, so I didn't want to go do it again. And when I walked into Jared's and stuff, for me, it was getting back into that routine. It was, it was getting into a routine with a purpose. And the, pur the purpose, as small as it was at first for me, was to kind of get back into jiu-jitsu because I loved it so much. I wanted training to kind of reignite my love for it. And then basically by doing that, by immediately getting hooked again in, in, into jiu-jitsu, it really kind of, you know, for me, something ignited something was just like, okay, look, I have more to work for than just liking jujitsu and training jujitsu and loving jujitsu again. Um, no, let's work towards a blue belt. Let's work towards small little goals. Let's, you know, screw it. It started. Uh, I remember, I remember, uh, what was it? I signed up for a tournament. I think it was a grapplers quest or something like that in early June. And I just started training again. And uh, I was, I got promoted to a blue belt maybe about a week and a half before it, a week, two weeks, whatever the heck it was and stuff. And I was just like, you know, you know, th like through, through Jared's confidence, he was just like, yeah, just go for it. Just go for it and stuff. So for me, it was just, it, 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 it like just getting back in that environment where you have someone to kind of push you a little bit uh, to, to, to just look for a little bit more, just that little bit more was perfect for me. It's exactly what I needed. And it like, cause I wasn't a confident person. I mean, obviously after a situation that I went through, uh, the situation that, you know, traumatic situation that I went through in uh, June of 02, um, trying to take my life and stuff. I was not a very confident person, mm -hmm. just very shy and everything like that. Very just kept to myself and, you know, having someone just kind of like nudge me over the edge a little bit, uh, just a little bit and test myself it was, and believe in me, it, it was really, really cool. I mean, that story about how I got my blue belt, there's a story behind there too. Um, never forget it. I, you know, I started training jujitsu again. And I remember it was like maybe two weeks into it, uh, it was an open mat. And I got to roll with Mike Fowler when he was a blue belt and late Dave Jacobs, the rock, uh, when he was a brown belt. I got to roll with them. It was a Saturday open mat. And then afterwards, you know, went home played my video games. As soon as I got home, realized I forgot my gi at the gym. So I call up the academy and I'm, you know, like apologizing. I'm like, I'm so sorry, Jared. I left my gi there. So forth and so on. I'll be there for Monday's class, Monday morning's class, 7.30 for sure. Um, you know, just throw it in a garbage bag. I forgot what I said. So I walk in on 7.15. I ask Jared, I'm like, Jared, where's my, uh, you know, where, um, I, let me get my key first before I forget again. I'll just like, you know, throw it in my car. I had a baby blue Cadillac at the time, 1993 baby blue Cadillac DeVille thing was a tank. It's awesome. I bought it at an auction for $150. Uh, the, in, or the auction fee itself was 250 bucks. It was hilarious. I was like, what the hell? But, um, so I sat there and, uh, Jared goes, I sat there, asked for my key. Jared goes, 
Uh, yeah, it's behind the front desk. So we're on Bustle Twin Ave, the, old, the, old, the, old, the original BJJ United. I walk behind the desk and I notice my gi. And it was, uh, my gi was an old Owano International gi. And when I say old, it was like the version that was like about seven and a half pounds without the belt. Uh huh. So it was like the suit of armor. Yeah, that was and, back when gi's like a nice gi just meant it was super heavy because then it was more durable yes. and it would last longer. Uh, do you remember the absolute Howard Combat kimono that was like nine pounds? Dude, Kyle had one and he could uh, wash it and like let it air dry on a hanger and literally stand, stand. up the kimono. Yes. No, I remember that too. That was crazy because I had one of those too and I would stand it up and I'm like, okay, I don't, that's not normal. <laughs> But whatever. But uh, so, anyways, I see my gi there, and it's it's folded up, and it is wrapped with a blue belt. And I was just like, Jared, what the, you know? I'm like, what the hell? Like, like what the hell? And he's in, you know, he's got a smile on his face, and everything is just like, no, 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 that's your gi, that's your belt. So that's kind of how I got promoted. And I'm the ultra ignorant guy, you know, because I'm just like, oh, I like, and I felt so bad, and. Next, you know, I, I am pretty sure I've talked to Jared about this. I, I've, I've apologized to Jared about this, but I was ultra ignorant. And I just go, Jared, look, I, I don't like, I hate to ask, but don't you have to be a black belt to promote? Because it was a problem. <laughs> I, like, I'm, I'm just like, I, I don't mean to insult you. I, like, I don't, because I don't know what to do. Like, I don't know if I should wear this or anything. And then he says like, no, no, it all checks out. It all checks out. And, uh, you know, I already talked to Lloyd. And, you know, after you left at Open Mat, uh, Mike and Dave Jacobs said something to Lloyd about me. And Jared um, sat there and said, like, look, I'm just writing a wrong. You should have been promoted a long time ago. So you should have been promoted at the Blue Belt a long time ago. There's your belt. And then uh, we went through 730 class. And you know, I was really happy and stuff like that. So he was saying, like, and I, uh, he was saying, like, well, if you can come back tonight, um, I'll promote you in front of everybody and stuff. Because I'm doing other promotions tonight. So I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he took the Blue Belt back. <laughs> <laughs> I took the blue belt back and um you know I went home I took the rest I, I didn't go into work and uh I just said like screw it I'm calling I'm calling off so I went back got promoted in front of everyone you know and that was really cool that was that, that was a really cool moment that's so, awesome that's a really cool blue belt story yeah that, yeah that's how I got my blue belt and which you know it was good stuff it's good that, fun, fun stuff that is cool well Mark um I am we're already kind of over on time from what I told you it would be, but if, <laughs> okay. if you have time, I would like to play a game with you to finish. Sure, let's do it. Okay, so the game is called Take It or Leave It, okay? So the way the game works is I will make a statement, okay? okay. Um, and if you agree with that statement, you say you take it. If you disagree, you say you leave it, okay? okay. And so um, then we'll probably discuss during yeah discuss discuss the answers okay no so um we always like to start out with something to do with the food from where you are living now okay and so i want to start with take it or leave it chicago style pizza is the best style of pizza take it oh you agree i, I agree i just had uh jeff seraphin on and mm -hmm. he was like leave it he's like he goes people from chicago he's like we don't eat chicago style pizza no, i do I, I, yeah, see, that's what I, I was like. I thought that I thought that was normal. No, there's that's the thing that you got to ask about. Oh, there's, everyone's got their own pizza place. Yeah, everyone's got their own pizza place and everything like that. And um, the quick fix for me is Lou Malnati's. Uh -huh. uh, that's like the chain, and that's the best chain one. And uh, my favorite all time deep, deep dish pizza is a small little hole in the wall place uh, called Burt's Pizza. And that is actually not too far from where the gym, where Newbury Training Center is. Uh -huh. um, and it was owned by this one person named Bert. Like he passed away, unfortunately. And uh, they closed for a long time. They recently reopened like mm, sometime last year. And Bert was known as like a pizza Nazi. Like uh -huh. Bourdain went there and everything. Where you needed to, if you wanted a pie on Friday, you needed to basically put in your order Tuesday or Wednesday. Really? You could not call Friday. You could not call Friday morning or let's just say you wanted it for dinner, right? And you want to pick it up at 6.30. You call him at 5.30 asking to, for, for a pie in an hour and stuff. No, 
No, that was a big <laughs> no-no. He would chew you out. He, awesome. he, he, in the morning, he would go and buy for, uh, ingredients for all, uh, fresh ingredients for only the pies that he was going to make that day. That's it. That's so awesome. you needed to call way ahead. That, and that was awesome. And here's the thing too. So it was a very small place, very, very small place. And um, maybe sat 12 people, well, a little bit more, but let's call it 12 people. If you, weren't, if you wanted to dine in, you needed to give them a time and you needed to be there on time. If you weren't there within a couple minutes, he would, and you walked in, he's like, hey, my party's all here. He would box up your pizza and tell you to leave. That's awesome. It was awesome. I was like, for me, I was just like, this is great. And it's, pro- it's the best pizza. It's the best Chicago style pizza. Uh, some of the best pizza I've ever had. Uh, I do appreciate thin crust. I do. Uh, it's, there's something about the dough, though, when you wrap it up. I'm not a big fan of like that kind of spongy dough, but I do like thin crust pizza, too. I get it. I get it. That sounds, uh, that sounds good. Okay. So next take it or leave it. Guard pullers are bad people. So take as I agree. Correct. Take it as yes, I agree. Take it as it. you agree. Leave it. Leave it. Leave All it. right. I like Leave it. it. Good. Leave you know, it. cause I have a, uh, you know, my coach Kyle, you know how he <laughs> feels about things. And, uh, yeah, so he would, he would, he would have taken that. Okay. So take it or leave it. Die hard is a Christmas movie. Oh, uh, Take it. Take Absolutely. It? Good. Absolutely. Good. It is. I am, I'm glad we're on the same page with that. 100%. It's the Asian thing. I get it. <laughs> Take it or leave it. There will be a Guy Worlds this year. Uh, I'm going to say take it. Right? Really? I'm going to say take it, and I think it's going to get – and I just have this theory. I have this feeling. I have this feeling. Well, it all depends. It's all contingent upon when uh, everything, when the all yeah, clear. Yeah. All contingent upon that. And I have a feeling it's going to be, um, I have a feeling, and the, again, here's my conspiracy theories on it. I have a feeling it's going to be June 1st. And I think they're going to, like, basically, I would not be surprised if they reschedule both world masters and worlds to be in Vegas this year at the end of September. Mm. Man, that would be, that That, would be crazy. That would be, I would not be surprised. Something tells me that it's, it's a logistical nightmare, Uh but if you really, but if you wanted to, something just tells me there's like, there's a whole bunch of back story stuff. Like, you know, there's a whole bunch of like stuff going on in the back that we don't know about. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, we as jiu-jitsu competitors and practitioners don't know about. And something just tells me that if the IBJJF wants to, cause, uh, wants to stay relevant, because, again, we don't know what the social climate's going to be mm-hmm. and if people are going after all this and if people are going to be afraid to train and touch each other and stuff. Um, and I think one of the things that they might try to do to kind of jumpstart the jiu-jitsu fever again might be to say, guys, what we're going to do is we're going to sit there and kind of actually have a world a world's world championship and world masters championship at the same time man that would be insane that would be nuts they would it would have to be that would literally have to be two weeks i mean i think you could do it as a week uh i think you could do it as a week a full week you're talking like saturday to saturday type deal thing yeah yeah Like it's, or maybe Monday through Saturday for sure. I think you Mm -hmm. could squeeze it Monday through Saturday, get rid of the Vegas open, basically make it worlds Mm -hmm. uh, and kind of go from there and stuff. And like, it's, it it would be very weird to kind of (laughs) stagger. Yeah. Referee staff is going to get paid good. Oh yeah. Yeah. You're going to need a lot of reps for that. But I just have this feeling that they might try to do something crazy like that because it would sit there and bring a lot of attention to it. Good and bad. But like, It'll sit there. for for that one week. It's gonna it's like gonna be like the World Series of Poker. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like you're, it, it, boom. Everyone's gonna be just immersed into it. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily rule it out. So I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna take that one, and uh, I might lose that one, but like I would take that back. I really really hope you're right about that. I plan on going to Master Worlds anyway, but yeah. it would be way more fun if Worlds was at the same it's, time. Yeah, it, yeah, that would be awesome, man. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I, it's, I, I just have this feeling. And people can think I'm crazy on that one. And, you know, I'm, I just have this feeling that they're trying to cook something up. 
That would, that would be, yeah, that would be really, really fun. Okay, so last, take it or leave it, the most important one that you'll get. Take it or leave it, Filipino food is the most underrated, uh, like, nation food-wise. There's one, uh, I hear, I'll put it this, I'm going to take it, 100%, uh, but it's, it's Filipino food, and not to forget, um, God, because I'm, um, I'm an aspiring restaurateur, uh-huh. And I uh, do, I am partnered with one of my purple belts and longtime friends since uh, who I've known since the Philippines. And we have a restaurant, uh, Magna, uh, Magna, uh, Magna Cucina, uh, which means great kitchen, uh, all the way up in Portland, Oregon, which is why I go to the Portland Open all the time, which is why uh-huh. you see me at, in Portland all the time, which is why I probably brought COVID back to Chicago. Yes. Uh, yes. We all agree. We're all on yeah. the same page. Because <laughs> I was there earlier in the year. Um, but yeah, I mean, Filipino food's great. It's, it's, it, for me, it's a lot of salty, mm-hmm. a lot of spicy. Uh, the problem with Filipino food, it's tasty, but the problem with Filipino food, it just doesn't look appetizing. It does and, not. Uh, it does not. It's brown stuff and rice, but it's deep fried pork. Who doesn't love that? So, <laughs> so, about them. Sorry. I love pork. I, like I'll eat it like crazy. I have the worst jujitsu diet, by the way the worst uh, i can i could probably compete with you for that but you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh like but let's then like lumpia shanghai who doesn't love the fried egg rolls everyone mm-hmm. loves that stuff that stuff is like man you don't need potato chips you just need bags of that stuff sell yeah. that on the street and there's so many good things about uh, lechon i mean ask how <laughs> about lechon <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, he wore that. He wore that pig head around for at the 15 year anniversary. Well. I know. I was taking pictures of it. Oh uh, well, <laughs> I I have pictures of it right now on my phone. <laughs> but um, you know, it 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 is it is great. It is a great. Uh, it's a great food. It's a great cuisine. Um, I wish more people would sit there and give it a whirl. It looks ugly, but it tastes great. Mm-hmm. Just stay away. From, stay away from the bullet. Because if you think the bullet is Filipino food, so what that is is a day. Um, it's about to be hatched duck embryo. Yes. So it's about to be hatched. You crack that sucker open, and sometimes you see feathers developing, and it smells horrible. It looks disgusting. It tastes great. Uh, <laughs> but if you're not a big fan of eating things with texture, stay the heck away from it because you might bite in, and you might crunch that beak, and you're like, oh, my God. <laughs> And immediately just spit it out. I've done it. I've done it. And it's, I've never, I've never had it actually. You know, my grandma is Filipino and, mm-hmm. uh, and well, so I guess my mom is, I think my mom's three quarter Filipino, right. but so we've always been around Filipino food, but she has kind of always understood that everybody married white. And so we are not going to be, you know, having almost duck embryo eggs. It's uh, it, 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 at Christmas parties, but everything else, we always have. So have you ever had uh, dinaguan, that blood? It's like that blood stew. So what it is. So is we, take... we had it I before. It. I oh, yeah. It. I wasn't a big fan. Was like literally, I would have been five or six. So you know what I mean? Like it was just something that you just ate and was just like, you know, I, I think when you're five or six, you usually don't have very strong opinions on food besides chicken nuggets anyway. Yeah. But it was yeah, just weird to me, you know? I love it. I love that stuff. And um, Carlo, my partner in the restaurant, he uh, his his rendition on it, his upscale rendition on it was like it's ridiculous. So I mean, he, you know, when all this is over and stuff, if you guys are ever in Portland, it's a great food scene. It's a great, great food scene. I like sometimes I want to go there when there's no tournaments, and just eat everything. Yeah. So this last, I remember, it's funny. The uh, this last trip I went out there. Uh, it was a Saturday tournament. I intentionally didn't come back until like as late as possible on Monday, just so I could eat whatever the heck I could eat on there. That's eat. awesome. Yeah, just come back really heavy. But yeah, there you that go. was Flip actually the food. that's actually the plan. Uh, that was the plan. If they combine worlds, it won't be the plan. But if it's just Master Worlds and I'm just going up to coach my old guys, I have literally have a list of restaurants that I'm going to in Vegas because oh, so Vegas? many. Yeah, because so many places like. Um, so many good chefs for whatever mm-hmm. reason, that is where you open a restaurant. What's your, what's your, uh, that's when you know you made it big. Uh, mm-hmm. That and, that and uh, Midtown Manhattan or somewhere in Manhattan. What's your, what's your hit list like? 
Okay, so my biggest one is going to be Roy Choi's new place that he just built there. What I forget what it is called. It's something really simply named. Of course, I'm going to do Gordon Ramsay's Burger Place. Um, that is great. That's I've good. heard I've heard so many people say that the F word burger is like the best burger they've ever had. Uh, I'm going to. Overall, it's a good place. Uh, my favorite burger is actually in the Cosmopolitan up in. Oh God! What I literally had the name. Uh, it's it's just outside the Marquee Club. Uh, it'll hit me when it, when the podcast is over. I know it's. You send hit. me send me a message when you yeah, when it. I'll send you a message, but it's called the Billionaire Burger. So it is Wagyu beef and uh, I think bacon. Combine them together. Foie gras inside. Uh, truffle oil on top. Some like uh, marmalade onions and stuff. It's good. It's the it's a thirty two dollar burger. Well worth it. That is, like, I'm in. That's my favorite burger. It, 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 like that's probably the favorite burger. I've I mean, I've before. I've eaten with you, Mark, and you have never you've never <laughs> steered me wrong. And so, yeah, I am in. Okay, so last question. This is always our finisher. Um, I am at a Mark Vivas seminar. I'm a blue belt, and during question and answer, I raise my hand and I say, "Mark, how do I suck less at jujitsu?" <laughs> Don't tap. No, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> don't tap to any. No, no, no. Um, it's a great question, actually. Um, don't ever give up training. You're gonna have your bad days. You're gonna have your good days. You're gonna have a lot more bad days than good days. All you really need to do, and again, this is what I learned through going back through jujitsu, and and, and 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 again, that my whole experience is through jujitsu is I just need to show up and learn just one little thing every single day and you will you will suck less and that one little thing could just be as simple as tying your belt right faster mm -hmm. uh i mean as simple as that for like the kids uh it could be as simple as if i if i widen my stance a little bit more in a knee cut i'm going to be able to distribute my weight exactly where it needs to be little things like that and you know jujitsu I'm sure you've heard this cliche. It's a game of inches mm -hmm. and, 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 so, and it's a game of inches and it's a game of building muscle memory and consistency. Um, you know, it's, you have to, you have to precision, like just like how Lucas, Lucas Lepre uh, 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 preaches all the time. Precision is such a huge, you, being precise is such a big, big thing mm -hmm. and you have to be consistent as well too. So, you're going to learn sometimes that you're not as precise. So you can fix that. You can fix that little inch. And then you can learn that you're only doing it maybe 60% of the time. All right, let's work on consistency. So you can be precise 60% of the time. So let's work on being precise 65% of the time. And just, walk, you know, just, you know, just take note. Have someone watch you. I'm a big fan of coaching from the sidelines when, um, you know, uh, when, when, during training. Uh, you know, being on the wrong side of 40, you know, uh, you know, wrapping up my master three tenure and stuff. Um, I can't train as, you know, I can't, I, I don't, I don't do like 15 rounds in a row anymore and stuff. Yeah. Uh, so I'll sit there and kind of just do a couple of rounds and watch a couple of rounds and watch. And I'm constantly watching uh, people and you know, sometimes I'll record sparring and just look at over people, uh, look over what I've seen and just be like, okay, you need to do this more. You need to do this more. Uh, it, it's, and, and sometimes, you know, when someone, uh, record your smarting, to be honest with you, uh, so that way you can see where areas of improvement, but all you really need to do is just basically have that attitude of, I just need to do this much more the next day. Learn one little thing, learn, learn one little detail and you will get better. You will inevitably get better and don't be afraid to try something. Don't be, I mean, I try to. My, my, my academy is really weird. Uh, there's not one specific style. Yeah. And I try to teach everyone the same fundamentals. And it's funny because when I teach fundamentals, it's hilarious too because I'm like, okay, so this is a, an arm bar from a closed guard and you do A, B, and C. Remember to keep A, B, and C in, in your head. These are the concepts behind it. And I just want to let you know, I don't do it like this because I, <laughs> I don't do it th like this because of the way that I'm built. So. Mm -hmm. Do it like this is the way that I was taught. This is the way that I learned. This is the way that I teach it. Once you learn this, because you need to understand A, B, and C, those concepts, once you figure that out, you can come up with your own way to do it. Now, 
just understand that you, I'm going to question you, not because I'm telling you you're doing it wrong. I'm going to question you. And the reason why I'm doing that is I'm poking a hole just to get you to think about an answer that plugs that hole. Mm-hmm. So you know, like I, the next thing you know, you'll see at my gym, guys that are, you know, D1 wrestlers, guys, guys that, D1 wrestlers that pull guard, D1 wrestlers that have phenomenal spider guards. Uh, you'll have all these guys that have never done anything athletic in their life, and all of a sudden they become like phenomenal guard passers and wrestlers and judoka and all this other weird stuff. And as soon as they learn the fundamentals, I'll be like, okay, guys, this is YouTube. <laughs> Start mm-hmm. watching it. Go nuts. Uh, it's like you're a teenager, go nuts and, um, you know, start trying to do stuff. And then once you sit there and figure out things that you really like to do, let's work together to just make it better and Mm -hmm. kind of go from there. Yeah. I think, I think that that is an interesting note coming up is as, uh, you know, blue, purple, and brown belt. I fought uh, a few different new breed guys. And, um, that is something to note is they did not at all have the same game. You know, uh, you know, I look at Leighton and Osher, you know, I fought, I think I only fought Leighton once, but I fought Osher six times, something like that coming up. And it was very, um, interesting to note. I kind of going into fighting Leighton as a brown belt, I was like, well, he's going to have a similar game and they were absolutely nothing alike. Yeah. Nothing alike, nothing alike oil and water go, but like you should watch them roll, uh, <laughs> before Matt moved to Iowa and when, you know, when he comes back and trains, just watching him roll, just like, guys, guys, grab the popcorn, grab the lumpia. And let's just, I'm sure. Let's just watch. Let's just watch and stuff. And, yeah, and they just try to tear each other apart. It's, uh-huh. But that's good, though. I like that. You know, for me, it's um, one, of, I, I, one, of, one of my favorite things to do is just roll as hard as I can, as long as I can, no time limit and with some of my students. And just I'll look at them afterwards and just be like, <laughs> 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 that was good. That was good. That was good. It was good. Let's let's get some let's get some water and let's do it again. I'm just like that was like a 45 minute roll. Like, 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 I'm gonna do it again. I'm like, maybe we'll see. <laughs> Give me a minute. But, yeah. That's awesome. Well, man, thank you so much for being no on the show. Thank you for uh, just taking time and you know just chat. No problem. No, I appreciate it. Thank you for uh, you know inviting me onto the show. Uh, you know, it's 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 an honor. Uh, you're doing a great job as always and stuff. Stay safe. Stay, say hello to your father and the rest of the gang for me and stuff. So. I will, man. Is there anything you want to say to finish? Um, guys, thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my story. And, uh, you know, it's, it's tough. And I know some of you guys are going to judge me for whatever and call me crazy and stuff like that. I think a lot of people who, uh, you know, who never knew this about me know that I'm a decent person, nice person most of the time, unless we're competing. We're just rolling in the gym. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I'm mostly nice. I won't break anyone's arms or stuff like that today. Uh. But (laughs) at at that, well, for right now. But, um, you know, just, you know, I hope that, you know, someone could at least kind of listen to my story and kind of at least see jujitsu or anything, whatever their jujitsu is and stuff like that as a way to kind of help better themselves, help pick themselves up, stay focused in life and um, just keep working towards something. Stay positive guys. Stay positive. You have to, it's crap. Shit happens all the time, guys. Shit happens all the time. It's going to be bad. Uh, Adversity sucks, but adversity makes you stronger in the long run. You know, that good old cliche, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. That didn't kill me. Apparently someone was looking up for, looking out for me saying I have stuff to do. And, um, no, so I'm going to keep doing it. That's good, man. Thank you again for being on. Thank you. Appreciate it. And that is the episode. That's all I got for you guys today. Uh, I really think that this episode was an important one, um, mainly because Mark's such a cool dude anyway. But what we talked about, I think, is just it is so uh, important because so many people struggle with this. I think people don't realize that too. I think it's very common um, to know one person in your life that you know really severely struggles from depression, but to not realize that a huge amount of people in your life probably struggle from depression. Some people struggle from depression and they don't even recognize it as that. They don't even recognize uh, that they are depressed or that they are struggling. They, or they know they're struggling, but they just don't know what it is. And I think the more awareness you can bring and the more 
uh, and the less stigma that you can have around these things, I think is so important. And so, uh, like I said at the beginning of the episode, if you guys know somebody that this episode could help, please send it to them. If this episode helped you, I would love to hear about it. Uh, if you wanted to, we, I would, I would ask your permission if I could share your message to other people and not put your name in it. But uh, if you wanted to, you know, say that this episode was helpful for you, please send me a message. But that is all I have for you guys today. I hope that you guys got something out of this episode. I hope that you guys are having a good week so far. Uh, it being Monday, I hope you guys are doing everything you can to stay mentally healthy. And I hope that you guys suck just a little bit less at jujitsu.